on with our main task, mastering these round arcs. Start with this simple balancing game that will make you feel more comfortable skiing on one foot. First, in place, like this, pick up one foot and ski and move it up and down, side to side, in and out. And then, skiing along on easy flat terrain, play the same game. First on one foot, then the other. Do anything you can think of with one ski in the air. Just goof around on one ski. It doesn't take long to develop a comfortable sense of balance on one foot, one ski. And then you'll find, as you lift first one ski and then the other, that the skis begin to make mini turns, almost on their own. At least that's going to be your impression. You stand on one foot and the ski begins to turn. Stand on the other foot and it begins to turn. And pretty soon you'll be making one-footed turns. But where? I want you to use terrain like this terrain here that's on the easy side. Open, friendly, green and blue slopes to start with, nothing steep. And this is the sort of turn that you'll soon be making. These are turns without much effort and without much technique. It's simply a question of balancing, first on one foot, the left foot, and then here, after a moment of hesitation, on the other. Enjoying the turn, letting the ski carry you around. This is really a process of making friends with your skis, allowing them to turn rather than forcing them to turn on easy, open terrain. Remember too that stepping onto your outside ski is exactly the same as stepping off your inside ski. Here I take the weight off my right ski and for the next turn take my weight off my left ski. Two sides of the same coin. one more game you can play to test out your new skill, a kind of self-test to see if you're really balanced on the outside ski. If you are, it should be easy periodically in the course of a turn, as I'm doing here, to lift that inside ski up. If it's really light, if it's really skimming the snow, you can raise it, lower it, raise it, lower it, without any way interfering with the flow of your turns down the hill. This is a nice way of checking where your weight really is. So how can we get that bent ski to turn faster, shorter and tighter? The answer is easier than you might guess. It's a question of pressure, adding a little more pressure and a little more twist to a ski that's already turning. You do this by pressing your knee forward and at the same time twisting or steering your foot slightly more. The best way I know to tune into this effect is with a series of easy uphill turns. In this first one, if I simply stand tall a normal relaxed position and wait one ski, I get an even basic bend, the actual bend of the ski carrying me across the hill in a long radius turn. But if I want my ski to turn faster and shorter, I press the knee in the direction I want to go and voila, the ski climbs up the hill. In other words, the shorter and quicker I want to turn, the more leg action I use sinking and pressing to make my ski turn faster. Here we can see the same two uphill turns from behind, long radius versus short radius. In the first, I stand tall and relaxed. The ski turns slowly. But now I'm sinking and pressing and at the same time exerting a little more steering pressure with my outside foot and the result is a shorter turn. One final comparison now, the long radius turn, riding the arc of a weighted ski, versus a shorter turn, flexing, steering, applying pressure to make that ski turn faster. 
So now you know how to shorten the natural arc of a turning ski. This is important because as an expert you'll use a lot of short turns and short turns are not the result of violent or overactive twisting. Watch how I shorten these turns by simply putting a little more pressure, flexing into the turn, steering the feet a little more, but never overdoing it. And this is really the image I'd like you to carry away from this part of our lesson together. The arc of the turn, whether it's a long radius turn, a medium turn, or a short radius turn, is still a round, clean arc, not a sudden pivot. The skis are still doing most of the work. A short turn is characterized simply by a bit of added pressure. The skis come around a little faster, but they're not suddenly pivoted. They're describing lovely, simple, graceful and efficient round circles on the snow. So far, I haven't shown you many images of real intermediate skiers. But I did say earlier that intermediates and experts use a fundamentally different technique. Now you're sophisticated enough to see the difference and see it clearly. Instead of riding their skis in patient round arcs, intermediates typically twist both feet suddenly all at once into a skid, a wide track skid with the weight on both skis. And we know what this means. When a skier stands on both skis equally, there isn't enough weight on either one to make it bend. The skis can only skid sideways, not carve an arc. Watching intermediate skiers, one has the impression that the start of the turn is everything, twisting the skis in the new direction, and the rest is only an afterthought, a sloppy, awkward, accidental skid. By contrast, the turns we've been working on are longer and more patient. The skis peel off slowly into their arc, the round belly of the turn, which is really the most important part. And this round arc is easy, because even though it's hard to see, I'm standing exclusively on one ski, the outside ski of each turn. This is almost a universal recipe for good turns on packed snow. Here, my best friend, Linda Wadehofer, skis a series of lazy, relaxed arcs down a very moderate slope. And of course, she's balanced exclusively on the outside foot of each turn. But this is not just a lazy technique for average slopes. It works well almost everywhere. We're almost there. But I know there are a few small details to clear up before we can say we've really mastered the arc of the turn. As soon as you start to feel and find your balance over the outside ski, your turns should improve radically. But it will still take a while before you feel as poised, as balanced, as efficient as the images in this video. So here are a couple of hot tips that will help speed your progress. First, your stance. Stand as relaxed and tall as possible. The only thing you'll get if you ski in a low, flexed, semi-crouching position is tired, fatigued leg muscles. In addition to standing tall, spread your arms a little wider than you think you need to. This will guarantee better balance in your narrow, one-footed stance. And forget that old story about always being forward on your skis. Try to stand right in the middle of your ski right in the middle of your foot. We've talked a lot about the role of the outside leg in ski. Have you been wondering what the inside leg does? The inside leg plays a caretaker's role, taking care of that light ski, while the other ski, the outside ski, does the real work of the turn. For many, maybe even most skiers, the inside leg is not even an issue. If you're standing relatively tall on your skis, your inside leg will simply mimic, or shadow, 
or imitate the action of the weighted outside leg, flexing into the turn as needed, but never putting pressure on that light inside ski. Once you start turning on one foot consistently, you should find that your skis stay closer together. But if your inside ski hangs up, then try this. Remember Christie's, Wedge Christie's or Stem Christie's? The secret to making them work was to gently pull the heel of your inside foot inward toward the weighted outside ski. Try a couple as I'm doing here and try to concentrate on that feeling of pulling your free heel inward. Now the good part. Keep this inward pull or rotation of the light foot going all the time even when the skis are more or less together. This is the cooperative complementary action of the inside foot and leg. The action that ensures that that light ski will turn in harmony with the active weighted outside ski of the turn. Now, instead of opening your skis in that Christie style beginning, simply focus on the gentle inward movement of the light foot. In a couple of runs like this, it will quickly become a habit. You won't have to think about it anymore, and the two skis will turn together. Well, so much for the inside foot and leg. But if you still don't feel 100% poised on your skis, I have one last trick for you, and that trick is side slipping. Now skiers don't side slip much these days because it's considered boring, but it doesn't have to be. When you side slip, your weight is exactly distributed as it is in a turn, that is to say on one ski. Most people think side slipping is controlled by pressing the knees in and out of the slope to edge, but a better way is by simply relaxing your feet to slide, and then tightening the feet in the boots when you want to slow down or edge again. What I'm doing here is what I call variable speed side slipping. I relax, let the skis slide faster, then tighten my feet to slow them down. All the while, speeding up and slowing down, I'm really perfecting the same balance and stance that I use as I guide the arc of the turn. And while you're side slipping, here's another game you can play. The falling leaf. Simply shift your weight backward and forward while pivoting your feet and you'll find you can do amazing things in a side slip. Remember, the point is not really side slipping. This is just another indirect way to improve your turns. So don't overdo it. After a few minutes of side slipping, it'll be time to ski again. Short bursts of practice and then let's do it. Now it's time to look at the moment of truth, the initiation or the launching or the start of a parallel turn. Of course, expert skiers make this critical moment look easy. There's a trick to it, and that trick is early weight shift, shifting your weight to the top or uphill ski just before you make a turn. Here's a closer look at what I mean by early weight shift. I approach the turn riding on my outside ski, which is also my downhill ski. From this position of balance, I'm going to step up onto the top ski a split second before the turn actually begins. Now it takes only a very slight turning effort, if any is needed at all, and a commitment of the body down the hill to start a new turn. This is what I mean by early weight shift. Early weight shift is so critical, we should look at it a few more times, only now closer, just the legs, boots, and skis. It always works the same way. The idea is to change your weight, be on a new foot before beginning the turn, not while you're turning, not after you've turned. From the lower ski, you shift to the top ski before twisting your feet. First shift weight, then turn. Okay, now you know what early weight shift is, but why is it so important? First, 
it guarantees that the two skis will always start into the turn together. Pure parallel turns. Second, it produces a slow, progressive entry into the arc of the turn. Just what we want. And finally, it puts your weight where it belongs, on the outside ski from the very beginning of each turn. Early weight shift is a real winner. So how can you make early weight shift into a habit? Start with extra early weight shift. Really exaggerate. Step onto your new ski several yards before you want it to turn, as I do here. Shift weight, hesitate, then turn. Naturally, you will want to practice this extra early weight shift on very easy terrain, so you can really concentrate on the timing. Shift your weight, hesitate, then turn. Early weight shift isn't hard. It's not a new skill but merely the precise application of something you already know how to do, balancing on the outside ski. It's only a matter of timing. But as they say, timing is everything, and it's got to become a habit. So after playing around with this extra early weight shift, come back to doing it just right. Shift weight, then turn, as I do here. And here's another neat way to practice early weight shift, skating. You can skate on your skis the same way you roller skate or ice skate. Skating is nothing more than dynamically projecting your weight from one foot to the other. And it's a good thing to do on those flat or boring stretches of a ski mountain, like these catwalks. Then, by skating onto each ski and pausing or hesitating a second, you can feel a turn starting underfoot. This is the perfect practice for the sort of early weight shift that characterizes expert skiing. We do this all the time, on almost every turn, only without the large, easily visible skating step. Try it, you'll like it. steep slope, but skiing a gentler, less aggressive style, Linda Waithofer does the same thing. She moves her body forward and down the hill into each new turn. To help you feel crossover now, let me suggest a couple of really strange practice games. They feel silly, but they work. First, traversing across the hill without too much speed lift your downhill ski off the snow and then make a turn somehow anyhow it looks and feels awkward it is but you'll discover that you can't make it happen without tilting your body down the hill crossover in fact it feels as though you're tilting over into space to your doom but somehow you never do topple over as the body tilts down the hill your skis catch up with you and turn. That's the secret of crossover. You can also try this strange maneuver. It's called the thousand steps, and it's nothing but walking, marching down the hill on your skis, lifting one foot, lifting the other, and so forth. When you try to walk around the corner, you discover that your skis just won't go until you tilt your body the way you want to turn another case of crossover or more exactly an example of what crossover feels like remember crossover is hard to see in most good turns but the feeling the sense of moving your body into the new turn should always be there and these rather strange maneuvers will give you that sense that feeling I want you to form a clear mental picture of this kind of skiing before I explain it in detail. 
The essence of these linked short turns is this. Your legs and skis turn, your body doesn't. This is so important, I'm going to repeat it. The secret of effortless link turns is that the skier's body doesn't turn from side to side. Only the legs and skis do. Could anything make this point clearer than these dynamic turns by Olympic medalist Kristen Cooper and her husband, Coach Mark Taché? The image may be clear, but the mechanism is harder to see. As usual, there's a trick. To link turns without involving the upper body, skiers use a movement pattern I call dynamic anticipation. At the end of one turn, I let my skis keep turning and carving across the hill, but my body doesn't follow them. To launch the next turn, I shift weight and tilt forward down the hill are now familiar crossover. And then, my legs and skis, which seem to have been twisted or wound up beneath my body, can untwist or unwind beneath me. Now they line up with my body again, starting the new turn, almost without effort. Once more, the wind up, then the release, and here, the unwinding to start the new turn. This alternation of wind up and release, turn then return, is so important that I'd like you to watch these same turns again in super slow motion. My upper body continues to move straight down the hill, anticipating the unwinding motion of my legs and skis into each new turn. Not just facing downhill, which would be passive anticipation, but actively moving downhill into each new turn, dynamic anticipation. This is the key that opens the last door into real expert skiing. And that's pretty much the story of the anticipated style of link turns. It's useful everywhere, and especially useful for linking short radius turns down steep slopes. The advantage is obvious. You don't have to turn the heavier mass of your body from side to side. And this means less work to do. The real work takes place just before you turn, as the legs actively finish the preceding arc. Then it's almost a matter of relaxing back into place to start the new turn. Dynamic anticipation means that each new turn is a reaction to the action that came before. A nice idea, but not 100% natural. It takes most skiers several days to master this habit. So let's begin. the transition between two arcs, the tail end of a turn to the left and the start of a turn to the right. By practicing this tail end of one turn, but without actually turning back downhill, we can master dynamic anticipation in a simplified setting, feeling our skis wind up beneath a quiet, relaxed upper body. When we practice this tail end of one turn by itself, but with anticipation, we call it a preturn, and we can learn preturns in three simple steps. First, an uphill Christy. Sink and steer your skis up the hill, but as you do so, make sure that only the skis turn, not your body. Keep looking straight down the hill, as though you were facing a target you've selected in advance. Don't let your body turn while your skis are turning. Next, the same uphill Christy but add a pole plant. I haven't talked about poles until now, because really, they're not so important until you start linking turns with anticipation. The pole action is simple. Just tilt your wrist to bring the pole into position. And that's all. As you flex your legs to guide your preturn, the pole will virtually plant itself. But why bother planting your pole anyway? When you're linking short turns with anticipation, the pole plant tends to anchor or hold your body in place. 
so that all the untwisting or unwinding takes place down below, at the foot and ski level where it really counts, like this. Now, to use your new pre-turn pattern to launch real turns, you'll need a bit more speed. Instead of skiing the pre-turn to a complete stop, as I've just demonstrated, all you have to do is start a pre-turn but not finish it. At the very start of your uphill arc, plant your pole, shift your weight, and go. Of course, our goal is not just to ski pre-turns, or just to use pre-turns to launch other turns, but rather to link real-life arcs smoothly and easily straight down the hill. Remember, the pre-turn represents the tail end of any preceding turn. Here, the end of each one of my turns works just like a pre-turn to launch me into the next one. So why bother with pre-turns? Because they're the best way I know to practice this style of skiing. To build your new habit of dynamic anticipation as quickly as possible, try this, a series of pre-turns across the hill. What I'm doing is simple, starting a pre-turn up the hill, then, with pole plant and weight shift, letting my skis come back to their original line. Not complete turns, just a series of turn beginnings, with anticipation. And when I run out of room, I can stay on that top ski a little longer and come all the way around. And then, of course, it's time for another series of pre-turns in the opposite direction. Stringing these pre-turns together across the hill in so-called garlands is really useful. It's a concentrated form of practice. In a few minutes, you repeat the key motion pattern, action, then reaction, many, many times. And it's a way to use easy open slopes to practice a skill that will become vital on steeper slopes, building the habit before you really need it. And one final point, your poles. Don't neglect the importance of pole action in linking turns. Your poles trigger your responses, and rapid ready pole plants are the glue that holds great runs together. As soon as you make one turn, your wrist should be twitching to get that next pole out there. In these next images, pay special attention to the smooth rhythmic pole action. It finishes our picture of expert skiing. But the soul of expert skiing doesn't lie in the details. Not in the pole plant, not in anticipation, not in early weight shift, not even in a bent outside ski. The soul of expert skiing is in the flow, the seamless flow of turns down the mountain. When all hesitation disappears, real expert skiing begins.